box or the um, chat box to ask questions or raise your hand. Um, and now I'm going to pass this over to my colleague, Dr. Brandon Smith. Thanks so much, Katie. It's great to have you all with us. Um, there are a few familiar faces and uh, a few new ones, but uh, great to see you all. And um, also to be joined by a couple of our uh, CAO uh, participants from this past year's cohort who will um, have a chance to uh, share a little bit about their experience later in the meeting. But thank you uh, very much, Matthew and Robin, for being with us today. Um, and there's Vicki. So we're, we're good to go. Uh, we're so glad to be able to share a little bit with you all about the CAO Innovation Community. This this opportunity actually developed a few years back when um, a, a longtime friend and um, participant of different Gardner Institute um, opportunities reached out to John, actually, and John can probably add some details to this story, but um, saying that he was really interested in gathering together a group of chief academic officers to build community talk about innovation opportunities and really develop a process for innovation. And that's how this was born. We've now just finished our second um, CAO innovation community cohort. And we just keep learning and refining as we go. Um, and we're just really excited to share a little bit about the process, the opportunity, and then um, hear from some past participants and also open the floor to your questions um, at the end of the conversation here. Um, to start off, uh, as, as uh, Katie mentioned, I'm Brandon Smith. I'm an Associate Vice President here at the Gardner Institute. Um, after having served at a couple of different higher ed institutions as a tenured member of the faculty and an administrator, specifically um, an Associate Dean of Academic Affairs for student success, um, and working on a couple of different um, Gardner Institute processes, a lot of the work that I have the opportunity to do involves uh, leveraging improvement science to um, advance social justice and equity in higher ed. Um, and I'll pass things off to my uh, colleague, Dr. Vicki McGillan, to share a little bit about herself. Vicki? Thank you, Brandon. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Vicki McGillan. I'm an Associate Vice President here at the Gardner Institute, and I have had the good fortune to serve as a Chief Academic Officer at uh, two independent institutions, one in Ohio and one in Oregon. Uh, I came to this work both uh, with my experience as a CAO behind me, uh, but also with an awareness of how this is often the loneliest job on the planet, uh, because there are no others like you on campus uh, to talk to, to confer with, uh, and that need to be able to, uh, to share ideas and to open up honestly with colleagues is absolutely invaluable. And uh, I've been so pleased to be able to participate to, uh, with this particular initiative. John. Hello, everybody. I'm really thrilled to join my three colleagues here. I'm looking forward to this, what will be a conversation. We've got a, some basic information we want to get through. Then we want to hear from you folks as to what might be your interests and see how I can respond to those. It's a special privilege for me to be with um, uh, Dr. Smith and McGillan. I don't know when I have worked with uh, colleagues who are more skillful as facilitators. I just marvel at their abilities. I love working with them. It's one of the most meaningful things now I do in my life in, the, in this institute of ours. So I'm looking forward to our next cohort, which will begin in September. We've had two uh, previous ones. The first one two years ago, we had nine chief academic officers from small, private, independent uh, colleges. They had all had that in common. And then the second cohort we just completed with 11 chief academic officers, uh, not from one institutional type at all, but from two-year, four-year, public, private, religiously affiliated, non-sectarian. It was a very uh, diverse group in terms of their positions. Uh, and uh, I couldn't be more pleased with uh, how that developed. And you'll hear from uh, several of those, uh, the survivors of that. Uh, speaking of survivors, uh, two of us are uh, recovering uh, former chief academic officers, and we bring that experience to us. And the third is, as you heard uh, Brandon introduce himself, is a recovering, not really, professor of theater. And we'll be asking him in this uh, um, process we're going through to uh, have us all as actors on a stage uh, writing a new play for ourselves. And that's what really what this is all about. Uh, you know, we all came into this role, we're assuming, not with the expectations that we be innovators, 
um, but I suspect you're finding that to uh, really move the needle, you do have to innovate. And we have an aspiration for this process, and that is that at the end of 10 months or so, you will see yourselves and be seen not only as the chief academic officer of the institution, but as the chief innovation officer. And we believe that your position, the reason we chose to work with cohorts of CAOs is that we are of the opinion that the role of the CAO is the single most important um, uh, positional role in the academy to achieve the academic and student success goals, as well as many student development goals that we appropriately have for our students. So, um, uh, Brandon, you asked me to give credit, a footnote here, to the person who uh, seeded this idea. Um, I want to speak, uh, reference uh, Dr. Uh, Sid Parrish, who's the Vice President of Academic Affairs at Newbury College in uh, Newbury, South Carolina. He said to me about three years ago, he really wished he had a cohort of people like himself to come together and um, develop jointly and form a support group and uh, share and a lot of other possible benefits. So that's exactly what we did and um, would love to do that with some of you. So Brandon, let me let me pass it back to you at this point. Thanks, John. That was perfect. Um, and actually, actually, John, we're going to ask you to share the, the next couple of slides again, because um, you you have a, a deep history with the Institute, so uh, if you would, please. Yeah. Yes, I do. Uh, this organization is immodestly uh, named for me uh, because um, uh, we wanted to sustain the work that I and my wife, Betsy Barefoot, had been doing for decades at the University of South Carolina and to uh, perpetuate the values-based work that we became known for. And so with help from others, particularly the Pew Charitable Trust, we were founded in 1999. So we're 24 years old now. We can vote, and legally drink and legally drive and, and do good work. And uh, I wanna make very clear our, our mission here because uh, in spite of the recent Supreme Court ruling and uh, some legislative efforts underway in a number of states, we are not abandoning this very clear, explicit mission of ours, which is the pursuit of um, activities and forms of support for institutions that uh, pursue the larger societal and our goal of social justice. I want to be very clear about that. We are a proudly nonprofit organization, um, and we rarely do anything alone. Uh, we partner with all kinds of organizations, and we have a number of um, philanthropic funders right now that are investing extensively in our work. Although th this um, uh, activity, this CAO cohort, we do not have a grant or anything like that to do. It's, it's self-supported. And uh, so uh, you know, within the mission of social justice, we're trying to enhance uh, teaching and all forms of learning and uh, the outcome of that that so many are interested in uh, retention and completion. But we're especially learned with, uh, interested in what, what people learn. What, what can they do with this college experience? What kind of citizens are they going to be? And how can they help all of us preserve our democracy? So that, that's our mission statement. And um, we're sticking to it. Uh, and um, my last thing I'm going to say here initially is that I rarely ever say anything simply, but this is really simple. And that is, uh, folks, the results you're getting right now at your respective institutions are the results of the way your organization is organized and led. And the way you're organized now is perfectly designed to get the results you're getting right now. Therefore, if you want to get different results, you have to bring about some change. And we're persuaded that the CAO needs to be the principal driver of innovation to effect those changes so that you can get different results. That is what we're calling here the central law of improvement. Everything we do in this cohort grows out of that. Back to you, Brandon. Thanks, John. Um, to, to build on this idea of systems and the fact that um, that we're all organized and working in uh, different systems uh, that have a lot of similarities, but that are also unique, um, we wanted to, to, you know, basically bring a little bit from a, a text called Complexity and the Nexus of Leadership, which really investigates, um, you know, this idea of innovation and the fact that there, there are so many connections, there are so many variables at play when we have um, outputs at our institutions. Um, some, some, some things that might 
flag that your institution is in a critical period. And some of these, some of these may be pulled straight out of the, uh, you know, chronicle headlines, but recognition that, that things that might've worked in the past just aren't working uh, in the same way. They're not producing the same results. Um, that in certain planning sessions, there's some urgency that some of your well-crafted plans just aren't necessarily giving you the output you'd like. Um, and the pace of internal changes is just increasing. Um, the performance may be declining. If any of these things are happening, the authors of this text posit that perhaps some innovation might be necessary. Um, additionally, they, they throw out a few more things that um, when there are concerns that small changes won't add up, um, when there are competing interpretations and passionate disagreements about external events, um, if anxiety feels like it's increasing, um, if the system's just not, you know, just not producing a desired outcome, um, or that you know the uncertainty that exists within the system undermines planning and change because you're not quite sure what you can count on. Um, and then finally, uh, in the absolute worst case, that maybe the future of the organization comes into question. Um, and while this may seem a little doom and gloom, I would posit that um, at least one or two of these has popped up with some frequency um, at various institutes, uh, institutions of higher education where I've served. Um, and so when we see these things associated with a subsystem on campus, you know, how do we develop a process for innovation? How do we how do we do that rapidly and ensure that changes are actually designed um, for for our improvement that we need and that we desire? Um, the idea that 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 we are leaning on pretty heavily in this work is that there are these ecologies of innovation, that there are actually pockets, subsystems on campuses. Um, where innovation may already be taking place, but may not be happening at scale, or that could could um, maybe thrive under some innovative ideas. Um, you know, innovation, at least in in this one context, although we've got some other working definitions for this for this group, but innovation is the outcome of a system wide set of processes and interactions. Um, what what these authors Goldstein, Hazy, Lichtenstein called the psychology of innovation, and so that's that's one of the things that we'll really be leaning into pretty heavily through the use of improvement science tools um, throughout this work. I'll go ahead and pass things over to my colleague uh, Dr. McGillan to share a little bit more about the process and the work. Thank you. I'm going to talk a little bit about the secret sauce <laughs> involved in this community. Um, we identify this as a community because it indeed acts as such. Uh, the individuals come together in the in the fall as absolute strangers, and by the end of the spring, I I, I think I, I hope our our um, uh, uh, alumni will be uh, willing to confirm this are leaving as both friends and and solid solid professional colleagues uh, who have knitted together in support of each other's initi initiatives. Our goal is to help you identify out those opportunities for innovation, to engage in a design process, and to implement a plan for action uh, to, uh, to ensure that change actually takes place. Uh, we all have loads of, of uh, analysis and plans sitting on our respective CAO shelves. Uh, that never got to action. And part of what we're focusing on is actionable activities that you can engage, engage in. This will involve a, also a process for cultivating a mindset of creativity uh, and one that will prompt innovation. So we're going to be bringing in neuroscience uh, as well as psychological research on what works in, spawn, in uh, being able to spark innovative ideas and to encourage innovation to take, uh, to take place. And then building that community of CAO peers so that ultimately you will have an understanding of the theories and practices in higher education, uh, what is leading to innovation in higher education, where the sources of resistance to innovation are and how to address uh, those sources of resistance. We will be focusing on how to build an internal team of fellow innovators to create your own campus-based team for this process, to develop that plan for a significant uh, innovation and implementation, and overall just to uh, think about how you, how you as a CAO can increase your institution's receptivity to innovation, with it not being oh, that thing that the provost wants us to do. One more time. 
Um, what's this going to look like? Well, it is my uh, pleasure to introduce our two speakers who will be sharing their experiences. Uh, Dr. Matthew Lautroff, Vice President of Academic Affairs from St. Petersburg College in Florida, I might add, <laughs> and Dr. Robin Walters, Vice President for Academic Affairs, Chief Academic Officer from East Central College. We've asked both of them to share honestly and without any hesitation, how was their experience in the academy, what they valued most, and what they were working on as a result of their engagement in the academy. So um, uh, Matthew, if you'd like to kick off. Um, sure. Uh, I, I will say after uh, wrapping up the, the last year, I'm, I'm kind of sad that we're not continuing for another year because it, it was a great cohort experience, uh, great mentorship from the team, uh, and it was a great uh, group of colleagues. It definitely, uh, it was very beneficial to have a, a strong peer group, uh, a variety of individuals who've, uh, some who've been in the chief academic role, chief academic officer role for a shorter period of time, some who've been in for a longer period of time. Uh, and so it, it was great uh, being able to share experiences and perspectives and we did a lot of, um, but while the focus was on innovation and the focus was on uh, large, uh, you know, intellectual models and ways of framing and structuring and, and thinking about in innovation, creating innovation, building innovation and a culture of innovation at one's home campus, uh, we did a lot of side discussions and side projects where we did a lot of problem solving and idea sharing uh, across the group. Uh, and so I, uh, I, I will say, I value the mentorship uh, from from the the John Gardner Institute, uh, and I very much value the the uh, my my peers who uh, we did the program together. Um, my project, uh, so I'm I've been at uh, smaller master comprehensive universities, uh, and uh, and when I say smaller, I say in the in the uh, uh, ten to fifteen thousand student range, and and, and uh, in the chief academic officer role, and I'm now at. Um, a school uh, where there's 40,000 students, but it's a, primarily a baccalaureate institution. And so a lot of things, a lot of projects, uh, and my focus on the innovation community was building a culture of innovation because I have to do everything at scale. I can't do one-offs or you know do a pilot project of 20. I need to do a pilot project of 2,000. Uh, and so that, that was the big focus of my project. Um, looking at student success and closing student success gaps and redefining student success uh, for our institution, not just at the um, course completion level or the progression level or the uh, retention level or the, you know, the, com the uh, degree completion level, but also in uh, the placement uh, of students in, in, in uh, meaningful and rewarding uh, careers connected to uh, what they studied or related to what they studied, making sure that we don't have gaps uh, for our student populations. Um, during this past year, the state of Florida has radically redefined how we look at demographics in, the, um, in our student populations. And so I'm now very strongly looking at Pell eligible and first generation students and gaps in their performance, uh, which closely mirrors other demographic characteristics of student populations. Uh, and so we are uh, continuing to move forward on ensuring our student success at St. Petersburg College. Oh, uh, thank you, Matthew. Robin. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having us here today to share this. Um, we had, um, you know, the experience, I won't repeat, you know, exactly it, as Matthew stated about the experience, but, um, you know, I, I am from a community college, one of the 12 community colleges in the state of Missouri, um, and it is lonely work. Vicki is so right. <laughs> it is lonely work. And um, to be, um, to have that experience when you're with peers from across the country and have that connection um, was, is, was a really good experience. And, uh, you know, while I do gather with the fellow CAOs in our state of other community colleges, um, we're all separately run community colleges, but we do collaborate on a lot of projects, there was a different feel in terms of that safe space. Um, and that was something I really valued. Um, as a matter of fact, um, every time we met, um, we turned off the recording 
and had something called um, CAO time, where we were able to bring up things that we just couldn't solve, we couldn't figure out, we couldn't kind of, or we, maybe we're just wrestling with something. And um, we had that opportunity in a real safe space to talk about some of the trials and, and tribulations of the work and the celebrations of the work as well, um, the rewards. So that was something that I valued, that safe place. And um, the other piece that I really valued, you know, when I, you know, I've been in my role as a CAO now for five years. So at year four, um, you know, I was meeting with the president of the college and really talking about, you know, where do you see yourself? What kind of professional development do you need at this point? And my first four years of the CAO was very much in that task space of working on accreditation, assessment, um, just very task oriented. And I was really ready for something to show me that there's more to this than just problem solving and putting out fires. And I knew there, there was. And so this really put me in a place um, to see that role as a CAO, um, being a fairly newer CAO. And we had some CAOs that had been uh, in their role for several years and needed this place again to see their role in a big picture, you know, sort of place where I'm not just working on tasks, but I really have a vision. I'm exercising that vision. I'm allowing myself the space and the time to do that work. Um, so that was something else that I valued. Um, you know, my, my work, um, my specific work was related to uh, engagement and community in the classroom, um, increasing that student engagement in the classroom. Our students are commuter students. Um, they spend some time in their car and they spend time in class and they're not here on campus. Um, and we don't have a lot of you know, activity sometimes in that extracurricular activity. We have some, but not as much as we would like. And we know that what we've seen in our programs of study that have cohorts of students, those students have a greater engagement and, and greater um, sense of belonging in the classroom with that same set of cohort students. So I focused on um, with my uh, team working in um, arts and science and general education classes and transfer pathways on integrating some high impact practices or some hybrid practices um, in the classroom to create a greater sense of engagement and belonging for the students. And um, we started with a study abroad program, a virtual and an actual program that we're getting off the ground this fall and working on an enhanced honors program for our transfer students. And um, so uh, we see that. Um, the other thing that came out of this um, process for me was the culmination of a innovation, a faculty award. And we, and we actually awarded our first faculty member in March with the Means Faculty Award. It's a family that's a donor in our foundation. They wanted to do something different. Um, and I approached them about this idea in a, in a, in a program. They loved it. And um, the donor was on our selection committee and our faculty members, two of them worked as a team to develop um, a high flex program and um, modality for learning. And they were awarded a $1,000 scholarship to their faculty development fund. Um, so we were very excited about that. And that, that came kind of from a brainstorm work um, with this group too, so kind of sums it up. Thank you, Robin. Vicki, before we jump, I'm I'm always a little uh, trigger happy there with the with the advanced slide. Are there any questions um, from the group for our for our guests? We just want to create a little space. If you have any questions about um, the experience, the work, um, or anything that they shared. And you don't have to speak now or forever hold your peace. We'll have uh, another moment here at the end. Go ahead, John. I can see. I saw you saw you start up there. Well, I just uh, wanted to uh, make explicit what both our guests were not really guests. They're members of this family now. Uh, uh, I want to make explicit. Uh, we ask each of the participants in the cohort over the course of the year to focus on something at their institution that they choose their total control of to practice a lot of what we've been trying to develop in the cohort. 
uh, to use innovation to really uh, add something to their legacy as a CAO at the institution. And you, you heard references to both of those for these two colleagues. And we would ask you to do that. And of course, we can't force you to do anything, but it is a, um, a really tangible outcome of the process. And I, Brandon, I also want to make reference uh, to um, something about you and and uh, and Vicky and I. Um, Matthew and Robin will confirm this. Um, Vicky made reference to psychologically um, driven research. Uh, um, most everything we're doing in this has a research base, and so we don't turn this into a seminar in that sense. But you'll know where our processes and our experiences came from. And we refer to Vicki as our family therapist. Uh, this is not group therapy, but you will find, uh, I think, uh, interaction with her and your colleagues therapeutic. Uh, and Brandon has, we've made several references to this phrase, but in addition to being a really accomplished professor of theater, Brandon has a doctorate in a new field that I never heard anything about for years of my work, but I certainly know now, called improvement science. And this, uh, a lot of what we do is uh, draws heavily from that and we're all the better for it. So Brandon, let me pass this back to you. And thank you, uh, Robin and Matthew. And you are going to um, be hearing from us, and, uh, as you know, and we're, we're linking the, the cohort is going to find ways to continue its work and interactions and fellowship. And uh, if you decide to uh, join this this year, you will be um, having some interaction with these folks again. Brandon? Thank you so much, John. Yeah, and I, I just want to also uh, echo a little bit of what uh, Matthew said there at the beginning, you know, knowing that uh, we won't see each other with the same frequency we've seen one another over the past 12 months is um, when I saw both of you pop on the screen, my heart kind of leapt because uh, it's been just such an absolute pleasure. Um, you know, I, I, will, I, I, will, I will miss seeing you uh, with that regularity, but look forward to other engagements. And I will say that uh, selfishly, this is one of the things that I look forward to every month um, is, is getting on the call with the CAO teams and hearing about how things are going and just being in community with you also. Um, to John's point, we'll, we'll look for every opportunity we can find over the next year to, to continue. Yeah, we have two, two, as you're going to hear, we have two events that are in person for several days of extended interaction. And we just finished our closing retreat. And um, I'm still a bit high from that legally. Uh, it was great. It was great. It was it was fantastic. Um, I think Vicky's going to talk a little bit more about the structure here. Um, so, Vicky, um, now that I've, I've uh, uh, part absolutely. of my sleep. No, absolutely. Uh, thank, thank you, John. Thank you, thank you, Brandon, and particularly thank you, Robin and Matthew. Um, as you can hear, it is that intersection around community mindset improvement science. Uh, that that is where the the secret sauce happens. Uh, that is where the important work of this particular community takes place. We have monthly meetings that are virtual via Zoom, uh, two-hour meetings uh, in the evening. Well, in the evening, East Coast time. Uh, it's a little earlier for those of you from Alaska, uh, but uh, 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 those happen every month. We hold a community. We consider the each of the cohorts as part of a larger community of practice and in fact pulled together uh, the last fall an event that had been requested by our prior cohort that we invited this cohort to uh, to um, help CAOs talk about how to respond to the Supreme Court decision regarding abortion regulations and how campuses can and ought and, and could respond. And we brought in a faculty colleague of mine from a former institution who shared some of the unique experiences and a whole lot of wisdom about what not to do uh, and what was happening at their particular institution. You're going to learn about improvement science methodologies, tools, and training, as Brandon has said, um, tools as well as for developing that innovative mindset coming from uh, my side of the, the house, the, uh, the, the psychology side of the world. It is most critically a space to work collaboratively with others. Uh, you will have multiple opportunities to be presenting your ideas and your project and get the wisdom of a wider cohort of CAOs who all care equally passionately about these themes. Uh, and we hold two in-person meetings uh, here in the lovely, uh, I, I kept my screensaver on from an earlier meeting just to give you a taste of the lovely Blue Ridge Mountains. 
uh, uh, we hold uh, two two meetings, uh, one in the fall and a culminating retreat in the spring uh, that bring the CAOs together for that critically important live interaction as well. Brandon? Thanks, Vicki. And, and just a little bit of uh, granularity uh, related to the, the meetings that are um, really just around the corner. Um, you know, the engagement is is almost a full 12 months. Um, you know, we, we usually wrap mid-summer. Um, as Vicki mentioned, the meetings tend to be in the evening, 6.30 to 8.30, um, and we, we do one a month. Uh, the first meeting this year will be September 12, and that'll really be a get to know you, um, an overview, and to help people prepare for the first uh, in-person retreat, which will be just a few weeks later, September 24th through the 26th. Um, that'll happen in the, as, as Vicki's background indicates here in the Blue Ridge Mountains, uh, specifically in Flat Rock, North Carolina. There are a couple of different airports um, into which you can fly. Um, both are, are a beautiful drive uh, to where, where the event will be held. And we'll, we'll really look forward to that. That's always a good time to get to know folks and also just sort of kickstart. Um, this is going to be indoors. This is going to be indoors, right? It is going to be indoors, but with beautiful views of the outdoors, John. Okay. Um, and then we haven't set a date yet because we always do that um, based on input from the cohort, but sometime next summer, most likely in the month of June, um, we will have that culminating retreat. Again, coming back here to the mountains, um, usually we do that in Brevard where our home office is, and, um, and it's a really fantastic way to um, wrap the event, um, hear from everybody about how things are going, and, and hear a final sort of capstone presentation of the work uh, over the. Also, it's also a commencement exercise. We want you to be properly graduated and sent out into the world. It's true. It's true. In fact, our, our commencement this past year uh, included a sort of surprise to us uh, dissertation defense of one of our CAO colleagues, and he he literally went to lunch, defended. And then came back uh, to do the commencement ceremony. Um, so it was it was really a special uh, special way to round out the experience, and uh, you know just just a phenomenal group and a phenomenal way to celebrate everyone's successful uh, work over the over the twelve months. Um, I'm going to pass things for this this last slide before we jump into questions to my colleague uh, Katie Locke to share just a little bit about um, how you can engage in the work. Thanks, Brandon. Um, so um, the unfortunately, um, as John said, this is um, the fees are self-generated. So we um, we don't have support for this. So um, there is a fee involved. Um, it is six thousand six hundred and twenty five dollars per person that can be split over two fiscal years to make it um, a little bit easier with budgets. Um, it does not include the cost for travel and lodging and in-person meetings. Um, the application process is very simple. It's about four or five questions. Really what we're trying to do with the application is to make sure that it's a good fit, that um, your expectations are in line with what we offer, and um, to make sure that you're going to benefit the most from the experience. So um, the um, after we're done today, we will send out a link to the application. Um, and we do um, accept applications on a rolling basis. Um, we're looking for a cohort of 10 to 15, I think. Tell me if I'm wrong on that. We have um, four people who have already um, signed up and are in the cohort. So um, so I would not, uh, no, this isn't a, uh, you know, act now. Um, there's no Ginsu knives in, uh, attached, but um, we do, you know, we do encourage people to apply early so that you're not disappointed. Um, so if you have any questions about the application process, um, you can reach out to info at gardnerinstitute.org or to any of my colleagues on the call today. Yes, and if you wanted to speak, uh, you know, privately with some of our veterans, we can give you a list of these folks and you can, uh, I'm sure they'd communicate with you. And I'd love to be a fly on the wall and hear what they had to say, but... Uh, and I just wanted to add our 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 alumni are are uh, in, include individuals from institutions as small as uh, a couple of hundred undergraduates and as large as chief academic officers of systems. 
so uh, it the the scale is is the not the critical issue here. It is the the commonality of the themes and the and the concerns. I would also add uh, just just because this has been something that they have shared with us in in many venues. There are many there are a number of opportunities for leadership development initiatives that are run by major national organizations. I would say that this one is rather unique, uh, not only because of the year long commitment, but because of the focus around both the individual development and the innovation development uh, of the chief academic officer. So now's your chance. Uh guests to you know feel free to um i'm not sure if you can unmute you may have to uh, you know post a question in the chat and then katie can unmute you um but please um let us know if you've got some questions either for um you know the gardner institute staff for our colleagues who've joined us uh the, the veterans if if you will um or for katie about about you know information about how best to engage um you know again we're really excited about this work uh we're We've already got a few people signed up, and we're looking for for a few more to to join us in another year of innovation experiences. And I would also say you can raise your hand, and I can unmute you. Um, we have a comment in the Q and A. No question, but excited to be a part of this. Um, thank you, Teresa. We're excited to have you join us. I see a woman grinning, and if I knew her name, I'd call on her, but I don't, so I'm not going to. <laughs> you all remember being in the classroom and calling on students when they don't ask to be called on. You know, you know, it occurs to me we ought to tell you because this is like a course. Uh, uh, there's homework. Um, we ask you to do some readings between the uh, sessions. It's a reasonable, well, uh, Robin and Matthew, was it a reasonable amount? I mean, did we overwhelm you? Did, it was, tell us. <laughs> it was reasonable. And when I unexpectedly needed to have surgery, the instructor, Dr. S <laughs> Dr. Brandon Smith, um, was uh, very patient. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't even get in trouble if you don't do the homework exactly when it's due, uh, is what I'm trying to say. But it was meaningful and it wasn't too much at all. And sometimes the homework uh, asks you to um, prepare something to to share with the group, either in the before the full group or in a subgroup. Uh, we do ask you occasionally to write some reflection pieces, um, and if not, to read those to um, draw from them and uh, share some uh, epiphanies that you've had. Um, the, the please know that these uh, two hours once a month, these are not lecture based. We will present you some information, but by and large, they're they're interactive. That's not to say that you know we won't try to share some pearls. We will, and um, and Brandon and Vicky will restrain me from overdoing that. Won't you? Yes. Okay. So we so, have a few. Oh, sorry, John. No, do we? What else do we need to confess besides that there was some homework? Um, I, I don't know about any confessions, John, but uh, we can we can certainly share a little bit more about the, about the details of the work and just the fact that that we we try to make the amount of engagement between meetings meaningful related to the problems of practice or the opportunities that are at hand at your institution. Um, you know, everything that we're inviting folks to engage in, we hope is directly related to a need or an opportunity at the institution, not not anything um, that wouldn't be. And if it ever feels that way, we would definitely like you to tell us. Um, yes. But um, but but it looks like we've got a couple of things here um, in, in the chat. Uh, it looks like Dr. Ball uh, is uh, from a theater background as well. So that's great. Great. I look forward to hearing more about that. And um, what about the Q&A here? So another comment, um, Kelly Toon says, I have no questions. This was great information and I really appreciate the time you've taken to share it. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Kelly. We appreciate you being here. I, I think one other thing that, that is probably worth mentioning, although hopefully you're, you're getting the sense of um, how we operate just from this conversation today, but um, 
we try to make ourselves very available um, to teams and individuals. So if, if for some reason your schedule um, changes and you're not able to make a meeting, but you'd like to meet with someone on our team to talk about, um, we record every session. We make those things available to you. Um, we make all of the all of the materials and resources available asynchronously. But additionally, um, you know, very frequently, we'll meet with individuals or teams from institutions to right. talk about uh, talk about the work um, to try to help advance, um, you know, whatever projects are going on on campus. So, so just know that that we'll be here for you during the engagement and afterwards. Um, you know, this is this is really uh, about building community to advance um, our collective mission. Yes, and if you if we spend any time with you outside the two hours a month, which I'm sure we will, I can't, you know, both the cohorts, we've all spent time individually with a number of the participants and or some of their colleagues. There is no fee for that, okay? There's, there's, this is not an experience where after you're registered, we think of other things we can sell you as part of this, okay? Promise you that. Um, I was so just we have... wondering, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, well, I, I was just wondering if Robin or Matt, Matthew had any things that they wish they had known about uh, before they got started. So, so I have to admit, I'd never actually visited um, uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains. And so for me, it was a nice surprise on how gorgeous it was uh, growing up out on the West Coast with the Sierra Nevada Mountains, which are a little more um, uh, barren once you hit 7,000 feet. Uh, the Blue Ridge Mountains are very, uh, very verdant. Uh, and uh, so it, it was a nice uh, a nice shock going up into the mountains. Thank you. I, I would say I didn't necessarily know this ahead of time, but was really pleasantly surprised that our sessions were led by the three um, that you see here. Um, it wasn't one-sided, it had multiple, there's multiple perspectives. Um, the strengths and of each came out and um, and I was just, um, you know, just so glad to have the expertise in the room at all mm -hmm. times. And, and, and that was a little bit of a surprise. I didn't, I didn't know that. So uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's something that was made clear even here today that all three of you are in the meetings, <laughs> in the groups Absolutely. and uh, bringing your strengths um, together. That was a, a wonderful, wonderful approach. Right. This is a very high commitment for each and all of us. So we did have a question in the Q&A. When would we like to receive the applications? We have um, set a set a deadline of August 15th, um, just so that you have the opportunity to complete the application, sign the agreement, and, um, and make your travel arrangements to get to um, Flat Rock for that in-person meeting. If you need a little bit more time, we can be flexible. Um, our deadlines are always soft. Um, we understand that sometimes things take um, a little bit more time when we're going through an institution. So um, if you need more time or have any questions, um, as we said before, reach out. You mentioned Flat Rock. Flat Rock is uh, outside Hendersonville, North Carolina, which is very near Asheville. There's an airport, a regional airport in Asheville. And it's about, oh, I don't know, 12, 15 miles to this retreat site. And uh, the site is a... Um, a place that has been used that has had many iterations. It was a naval training place, if you basically you can imagine, during World War II, with no water in sight. Well, they have a pond and a little waterfall and a water mill, but um, and uh, it's been a camp and it's now it's a it's a kind of luxury retreat site with gorgeous food, a lot of which they grow on the property. And there's a there's a larger airport in Greenville, Spartanburg, which is about an hour, um, but Asheville has six airlines which service it, and uh, Greenville has even more and greater frequency of flights but uh you're not you're not coming to an area that is um particularly um well i wouldn't say it's that isolated we one one thing we found you know thinking of something we didn't stress before is that um some of this some of the folks found this out kind of on their own but when you if you if you do this and you come for the retreat and we well, will come for the retreat uh, which will be in advance uh in late september you might want to come in early uh, we're near a great tourist mecca of Asheville and the blue ridge mountains and if you want to do that we could help you 
you know know what you might want to see and um, so that's uh, it, it, it's fun to combine coming here with some other things you can do here and you'll just be in the early stage of the fall foliage season And that Vicky's backdrop there, that is that is actually what she's looking at. And uh, so uh, <laughs> it's not, a, you know, something we dropped in from Hollywood. Uh, well, we'll stick around for just a moment. It looks like a few people had to hop off. But if you have any questions, um, we can stop the recording. Um, but thank you all for being with us. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing some of you uh, this fall. And if any of you want to have a more in-depth conversation with any one of us, just reach out, okay? We're happy to talk to you. And particularly thank you to Robin and Matthew. Absolutely. Uh, so appreciated your experience. We didn't promise them anything, uh, <laughs> right? We got to see each other, so. <laughs> there you are. That's a sufficient reward. Well, you're not seeing the last of us here. That's right. Okay. Thanks, well, everyone.